your webinar is being recorded. Got it. Thank you. Welcome to week four of Application Jumpstart. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray as we get started here. Um, two things, change your chat to everyone. And in that same chat box, go ahead and let us know where you are watching from. And if you are applying to medical school, this coming cycle. Uh, I am joined by my great friends, <laughs> uh, Rachel Grubbs. I was looking at Slack message come across. Uh, Rachel Grubbs, co-founder at Mapped and uh, test prep expert, pre-med expert, been hanging out uh, in the test prep world and pre-med world for 20 so years now. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm good. I will get better as we get into this because awesome. I love this session. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, also joining us tonight, Dr. Scott Wright, former director of admissions at UT Southwestern, retired executive director at TMDSAS, all around cool guy. How you doing, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's uh, wonderful to be here tonight. I'm very excited uh, for what we're going to do. And uh, so luckily the power grid here in Texas is holding <laughs> steady for at least one hour. Wood. So <laughs> hopefully it'll continue. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, ho hopefully it, it holds up to the cold front. <laughs> exactly. uh, and last but certainly not least, Courtney Lewis, former director of admissions at Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine pre-med expert turned now was before uh the joining uh the osteopathic medical school and uh has come back to the light side after being on the dark side um coming coming to give good wishes to all and to all not a good night yet because we're gonna have a great night before uh before we wish you good night how you doing Courtney I'm good <laughs> oh man it was nice. I, I stopped playing my ranked Call of Duty to hop on here and <laughs> thought that this was a, a better use of time. Happy to be here. Oh, okay. Now now I have to ask a question. Uh, yeah. Is there, like, was there something meant by saying ranked Call of Duty versus just saying yeah. Call of Duty? Yeah. yeah. Ranked is a competitive play against um. other people, and I'm in the top 2% of the world, so it's a, just... Just drop that right there but yeah <laughs> yeah not not many know you used to be a very very competitive gamer ranked one of the top in the country in the world something like that all gamers yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome yeah that's that's just you know be nice when i was yeah. young when i was yeah. very young so. Yeah. So, so here, here's an idea for you. We're we're gonna spit fire while while everyone waits here for a second. I think we we have a Twitch channel. Yeah. Um, you are free to jump on and play your game and answer pre med questions as you're playing. Like I could game. do it. Yeah. I, I would think love it'd be that. so fun. Yeah. Let's do it. All yeah. Right, we we'll, we'll we talk locked offline. down that Twitch handle a long time ago, going like, well, you never know. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> here we are, friends. League of uh, Legends, World of Warcraft, Call of Duty. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. That is amazing. All right. We, we'll, we're nerd, we'll nerd out about that after. Yeah. So tonight, my friends, as Rachel's sharing screen, we are going to jump into our fourth night of application jumpstart, talking all about the medical school interview. We are going to bore you for about three or four minutes with a couple slides talking in general about the interview process. And then we are going to take some brave souls to raise their hand and bring you on and grill you in front of your peers um, and ask you some questions and see how you do, or a question and see how you do. So uh, be prepared for that. Get ready to raise your hand or you can raise your hand now if you wanna go ahead and jump in line and we'll uh, we'll get started. So Rachel, you wanna, wanna talk? Yeah, so like Ryan said, the uh, portion of the event that is slide focused is very short. We're gonna talk briefly about some major mistakes to avoid. Uh, Ryan's got a little like, metaphor, analogy, simile. I get those confused about why interviews are like musical chairs. Oh, they're like musical chairs. So it's yeah, a simile. So um, and then live practice, friend, we'll get right in. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Dr. Scott Wright, mm -hmm. what's the problem with preparing too much and sounding too rehearsed? 
Uh, you pro- you sound rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the what's the problem with that? So I like I know all my words, right? Uh, an actor can never be too rehearsed. It does. Well, yes, they can. But <laughs> I, I think the problem is when the, when you're too rehearsed, uh, it comes across as not sounding genuine, and uh, and it, it sounds like you memorized the script that anyone could have written for you, and uh, that you're just kind of blobbing it out there as opposed to being in the moment and genuine to yourself and uh, talking about what what is meaningful to you in a conversation about you. So rehearsing it uh, is, is, a, is a, if it comes across as being rehearsed, that's a downer for, for most app, for most of the interviewers, I think. Yeah, definitely. Well, about being too negative, Courtney, uh, negativity is something we talk a lot about in personal statements and other essays. In the interview, uh, what what does negativity convey potentially? Usually, um, placing blame other places other than doing self reflection, and uh, it's you know you only have generally 20, 30 minutes, sometimes only seven or eight minutes with somebody, and if your interaction is all revolved around you know a tone that's negative, a topic that's very negative and and doesn't have a purpose or uh, you're kind of negating some of the things that you should be talking about. It's just, it's not a best use of time. Yeah. Medical schools. I I often um, talk about how medical school admissions committees are trying to build a community of students with different backgrounds and, and likes and tastes and whatever. Uh, And and that negative aspect is potentially throwing a wrench into um, uh, that admissions committee members, that interviews uh, interviewer's ability to go, this person would be an awesome addition. And be like, oh, this person's going to be the Debbie Downer of the bunch. Yeah. Or, and, or Donald Downer. We don't need to yeah. genderize the negative person. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, they're going to ask you probably some tough questions that are about weaknesses and, and things that maybe you don't want to highlight or have to bring forward to the front, but you can still pose that in, again, a self-reflective and, and more positive, this is what I learned tone and, and way so you're not just, yeah. You know, it's just such a short amount of time <laughs> to, to build rapport with somebody that each, each minute counts and it's, you want it to be a good reflection of who you are as a student, how you are to teach and how you'll be part of the cohort. Yeah. Rachel, smile. Smile, Rachel. Isn't it bad for, for men, especially, to tell women to smile? What, what? Let's talk about not smiling here as a, a mistake. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I was thinking about that because I figured you were going to call me, and I was like, <laughs> it's kind of like that weird, shy, white person <clears throat> smile, like, right, <laughs> as, a, as opposed to, like, the big tooth clown smile. Uh, yeah. The thing about smiling is you can kind of smile without your mouth, right? It can be just the expression of your eyes, your face. What we're getting down to here, it's sort of related to the negativity, is you get a short amount of time to make an impression, and humans are highly suggestive to body language. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're fidgeting a ton, or if you're looking down a lot, or if you have to look up the whole time you're talking, some looking up while you're thinking happens, but you know, I'm kind of demoing, those things are distracting. Um, so just making eye contact and having you know, a smile between sentences or at the end of an answer, just goes a long way to setting the person at ease and they may not even consciously realize it, but yeah. it also makes you feel better because studies show, that if you're happy, you smile, but also if you smile, your body's like, oh, we must be happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I want to highlight the first three here um, and and looking at the last one as well. Um, yeah, no, the first, the first three specifically, being too rehearsed, being negative, not smiling. They all are tied together into what? For those of you listening, for those of you watching right now, let's see, what do these three things, if you're doing these things, what does that put a barrier up for? That makes sense. See if anyone has an answer. Let's see. Remember, set your thing to everyone. We have a quiet group here tonight, unless they're answering in Q&A. 
Uh, they're not answering no, they're not. a Q&A. Uh, personality, potentially Jordan. Sounds like maybe you don't want to be there, potentially Devin. Communication. Yeah, it's human communi communication. And um, and I could, now I forgot the word. Like, connection. Ooh, Jenny connection. Jane got it. There you go. Connection. Um, yeah, you're you're missing the the human to human connection. And if you are too rehearsed, that interviewer can't connect to you. If you're negative, that interviewer doesn't want to connect to you. And if you aren't smiling, potentially that kind of goes along with maybe being negative or portraying some negativity. And, and yeah, it separates you and the interviewer. You're missing that human-to-human -human connection. So those are huge, huge things. Uh, inappropriate, Josh, I'll, I'll ta tackle this one. Uh, I often say you want to be memorable on your interview day, but you don't want to be remembered for what you wear. Um, there are uh, standards, <laughs> professional standards. Medicine is a very traditional uh, professional setting. Uh, Dr. Scott Wright, uh, and then I'll ask you as well, Courtney, um, what is the most bizarre piece of clothing or outfit that you've ever noticed on interview day? Um, so the the thing that comes to mind initially is a very, how would I say this politely? Um, it was a young lady who had on a bright red dress that would have been appropriate in the bars on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Was her name Roxanne? No, her name was, okay. well, I don't know. <laughs> she didn't have to put on the red light. No. So it was not, not, uh, not appropriate. Yeah. Okay. So, so a little too revealing, a little too uh, party-ish, not professional right. enough. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. What about you, Courtney? Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, your your sound's a little wonky. I feel like we're picking on the girls here because mine is also a girl that's most memorable. And it was because just the skirt that she was wearing, it has, you know, usually there's a small slit in the back. This time it was in the front. And it was, I would say, an aggressive slit <laughs> in you know, where it was, I was, you know, kind of, ooh, okay, <laughs> kind of nervous when she would sit down and do things. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to approach her about it, but it, it was, I was panicky about it because it was so high. Yeah. Um, but I've seen, you know, teal pants, colored things, and you can make those things look nice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, writing that line, you know, make sure to snip off the little string. Some people you could tell they just bought like the suit right before yep. they showed up for the interview because this is still and then their little tail flap is right. still stitched together and things. Yep. And yeah. Yeah. I, I was watching something the other day and I'm like, oh, it's the style now to leave on the like brand patch on the sleeve. I'm like, all right. Oh, this, you're kidding. Yeah. Me. Yeah. It was it was some sporting yeah. event. I, I don't know if it was like the Heisman uh, ceremony that I was watching something. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. So, um, OK. And, and number five on the list uh, outside of inappropriate dress is not doing mock interviews. Rachel, to me, this one seems like it's counter to the first one. How can you not be too rehearsed, but also be rehearsed? <laughs> Where, where's that balance? Yeah, well, I think the big difference is, is that mock interviews are practice versus rehearsal, right? Talking so about practice? Yeah, I think so. To me, when you say rehearsed, I think about actors who have a screenplay to memorize and they're working out blocking. I, I think about, and I've seen this, students who write scripts and then try to memorize their scripts and then they might not even be answering the question because they just got a question that was close and went insert script here yeah with doing mock interviews uh one of the things i like to say to the students i work with one-on-one -on -one is i'm not trying to get you ready for everything i'm trying to get you ready for anything mm -hmm. so let's go through some of the most common questions and some different types of questions Let's get your brain used to answering some of these things, right? You can certainly come prepared with why medicine. You may or may not be asked it in every single interview, but it's a biggie. Um, 
a lot of schools are going to want to know why this school you can do research and think about that. But what I like to think about is as you're doing those answers you're kind of thinking of bullet points. You have like key topics you want to hit and then you're letting your beautiful brain create words on the fly, like we all do every day all the time when we're talking to each other. Yeah. Courtney, what is the the worst thing an interviewer can come back to you as 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 the director of admissions, former director of admissions? What what's the worst thing a, an interviewer leaves the interview and says this, and you're like, oh, that that person wasn't prepared or was over prepared. What what's the worst thing that that they can say? I mean, a lot of things come to mind about being abrasive or, or really biased or judgmental. Um, I would say one that I heard commonly actually was that interview candidates would only make eye contact with the male in the room and not the female interviewer. And um, that happened more times than um, it ever should. So make sure you are giving eye contact to both. So I would say that that's an easy one to kind of pinpoint and say that that was always a negative. Yeah. Dr. Scott Wright, what about yourself? What, what do you think is something bad that an interviewer can say post interview? Uh, uninspiring. Mm. That they, you know, they, they, they didn't seem engaged. They didn't seem excited. They didn't seem, uh, they, they were just sort of blah and inspiring. And, yeah. uh, that's not something you want to hear at the end of an interview. Yeah. Uh, I'll add a, a top uh, six mistake here. That's probably a little bit higher up on the list. Uh, I had a, a great interview. I think it was episode 288, if I remember correctly, of the pre-med years. It's premedyears.com slash 288. It was an interview with a uh, good friend, Dr. Layla Amiri, formerly of the University of Illinois College of Medicine, now at uh, Lerner College of Medicine at uh, Vermont. And during the interview that I had with her, she talked about the one of the things that an interviewer will will come out of an interview and say is that the student give, didn't give me a chance to learn who they were. Mm -hmm. They were too busy selling what they thought I wanted them to be, and they wouldn't just allow themselves to answer the questions mm -hmm. authentically and honestly and, and just show who they are. Mm -hmm. And so number six here, selling yourself, go in, have a conversation, answer the questions. They already like you. You got an interview, just connect with that interview or it goes with the top three of just lacking that connection. So let's talk about it. What's next? Hmm. Um, um, tell us about musical chairs. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe there's a little mix up with this slide. I'm not sure how this relates to the interviews. Typically, I talk about uh, the application process in general, the um, rolling admissions in terms of musical chairs. So I don't think I don't think this relates to interviews. So let's get to this one. So let's practice. What do you think? So I, this, I told you. I'm just going to put out, I put this little comic here because anytime I have to go live on camera, I think about this. <laughs> I think about how I do, oops, sorry, have low self-esteem and also, you know what? I, I'm great. So if you guys are feeling nervous, don't. We're all here to support each other. Let's be brave. Yeah. yeah. Do, do we want to tell people they can keep their cameras off just to be a little braver? Mm -mm. No? Never. I or is that a yes, to, Scott? I think they need to have their cameras on. All right. I mean, that would be. He has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> it has been decreed or whatever. Um, all right. Let's bring on Michelle. I will allow you to talk. <clears throat> uh, I don't know I what's going on. Spotlights. We can add them back as needed just to make all the right. screen a little less cluttered. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Michelle. 
cannot hear you. I can just barely hear her like she's miles away from her microphone. Yeah. All right. We'll uh we'll go to the next person. Um uh, let's lower hand. Michelle, figure out that sound. We'll bring you back on. Hadley. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Let's uh let's remove spotlight. We'll do that. We'll do it that way. Um, mm. I'll turn your video on. Yep. Can't All right. It. it looks like I can't spotlight non uh admin people. That's a bummer. I don't. Know, right. I think you maybe can't spotlight her because she doesn't have her video on. Yeah. Hang on. Maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll keep moving on. <laughs> we'll bring Ty. We're uh, having some great success in the world of virtual interviews, my friends. Make sure your technology works. Um, I can turn video on. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So you have to make them a panelist if you want them to turn their video on. Uh, uh, well, well, we don't have to have video. Yeah, nobody. Uh, okay, so that's that's uh, just a bad um, webinar setup setting. All right, my friend. Sorry about that. Hi, Let's, can you hear me? Uh, hello, T1. Yes, T T T. Why did I say T1? T Y. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. So, uh, um, Doctor Wright, take yeah. take it away. T Y. Is that what you go by? Um, that is what I go by, yes. Okay, excellent. So, T.Y., I have a question for you. Sure. Tell, tell me the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Oh, um, this is the moment where I realize I'm sorely unprepared for this, and I clicked into this because I got the email from <laughs> Brian Gray, MD. So, Do your um, best. Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, is Medicare state specific and Medicaid is a joint federal and state program? Okay. Um, Tell me more. Just whatever you know. I know. I guess because I hear Medicare and Medicaid as a joint term so often, and I am only really familiar with Medicare as opposed to Medicaid, because I think Medicare is more widely um, applicable to the general populace. Mm -hmm. And I live in the state of California. And so um, I usually hear like Medicare, Medi-Cal, uh, mm -hmm, right. and I'm not super familiar with Medicaid. Okay. So, so let me, let me, I, I want to, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, and I I had assumed that there might be a lower income or er, lower income limit for Medicaid as opposed to Medicare. Okay. And so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, sorry. So sorry. There no. are there are some physicians who do not accept any Medicaid patients at all. Mm. How do you how do you feel about that? I believe that because there are so many different types of practices allowed in the United States, that physicians do have a right to choose who they are willing, like who they are accepting or not accepting, because insurance policies in the United States are just really complicated. And mm -hmm. I think healthcare in general in the United States is not, mm, it's not fair or equally distributed to uh, everybody in need. And so I, I think for myself, I would think it's probably wrong of you to discriminate against people who have different types of insurance or different, uh, different coverage. But I personally think that this is their physician's right to do because of the current state of healthcare in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a physician didn't want to serve poor people, they have the right to do that? Um, technically, 
Yes, mm -hmm. they do. Would mm -hmm. I consider them a great person? Uh, no, not really. But would you consider them a Would you consider them a great physician? Hmm, that's a really good question. <laughs> I personally, <laughs> I I guess I personally would not. Mm -hmm. I am coming to medicine with a background where I, um. I was a sociology major and really into social justice and public health. And that's where I came from before I thought about medicine. And so for me, I believe medicine should be for everyone because everybody deserves life. But if, but, um, and so I don't really think about medicine so much as like, or sorry, being a physician, of course, like if you have talent, if you're really skilled, yes, you would be a great physician. But I think part of what being a physician is, is also having the philosophy and the heart to help people when they really need it, regardless of where they come from or what the circumstances. I mean, that's just part of the job, I think, as a global citizen, that's part of the job. So. Okay, so I, I'm getting confusing uh, messages from you. On the one hand, you say it's their it, it is their right to not serve people that need to be served. Yes. And on the other hand, you're saying it's uh, a, an issue of social justice. So which is it? Is it the oh, right from... to not do it, or is it their responsibility to do it? Oh, I see what you mean. I'm saying legally, it's their right to not do it. So I can't argue. Uh, from my point of view, if I was to have an individual conversation with every physician and really ask them why they're doing this job and what drives you to do this job and what, like, wh where do you see yourself in life and how is this your calling, then I think that it's their responsibility to do it. Okay. But, so that, yeah. and, right. and this is, this is uh, the essence of- We, of, we can keep going. Yeah. Keep going, yeah, Scott. This, but I wanted this is, to- This is the essence of- answering the question that was asked to you because what i asked to ty was um some physicians do not accept medicaid patients and then my question was how do you feel about that and you told me it is their right not to serve medicaid patients yeah my so she question, was talking technically you were talking technically what yeah. i want to hear is how do you feel about this what are your yeah. thoughts about this well, you know, uh, I'm not asking you to 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 quote a rule book for me. Mm. So, yeah, interesting. Good job going first, though. <laughs> Good job, yeah, right? Thank you for right. going first. Good job. So, so for clarification, Medicare is typically what we think of when we think uh, nationwide uh, old people health insurance. Uh, over 65, there are exceptions for people younger than 65 to get Medicare, but in general. 65 and older is Medicare. Medicaid is typically income-based um, and state-funded uh, typically mm -hmm. and state-run uh, for Medicaid. So federal government-run Medicare uh, and then Medicaid is um, uh, state-run. So, yeah, And I'll tell you the, the, the easy way to remember that is if you think about that the word Medicare has an R in it, and R stands for retired people. Mm. Medicare R retired people. Nice. All right. Let's um, I think it was Michelle. I'm gonna was it Michelle that we had on earlier? The first one, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So we'll we'll bring Michelle back on. Um how's the sound, Michelle? Hello, can you hear me? We can. All right, Courtney. Michelle's on the somewhat uh, medium <laughs> medium roast seat. <laughs> oh, seat? Okay. All right. You ready, Michelle? Yeah. Okay. So can you describe a situation from your past that demonstrates you're a person of integrity? Um, yeah. Um, so... Can we use, okay, so basically I was part of an, this like experiment. So it was for NASA. So you got to write um, a write-up for an experiment that you would want to do if you were to get selected. And the experiment would be done on the International Space uh, Station. And so basically you get to 
write the experiment and then you answer a bunch of questions about it. And if you were to get selected, you would get to go and work with scientists at NASA. And mm -hmm. so I worked with a partner, which you were allowed to do because you could form groups. Um, and we did have, and you can have a faculty sponsor to look over the experiment and give ideas. So the partner that I worked with wanted to like get more, kind of get this uh, mentor to give us more ideas and kind of write stuff for us, which is not what, the, what that program was about. And so I kind of had a discussion with her and told her about how that's not right. And like, if we were to get selected, it wouldn't be fair because those ideas aren't ours. And that mentor is a lot more experienced than us. So, and everybody else that does is part of the program has, you know, experience seems to us because it's everybody that, you know, isn't an educator yet. And so we had a conversation and we ended up doing it by ourselves. And the mentor just kind of read over it more like for grammar and kind of if like our ideas made sense and if what we wanted to kind of express to the person reading kind of goes through. Because sometimes you, like words can get lost in translation. Okay, all right. And what was the outcome of that contest? Um, so we actually didn't get selected because I think they only select five people to do mm -hmm. it, but it was still like a really great experience because it was like the first time I got to be part of uh, deciding on an experiment and coming up with a hypothesis and possible procedure. Looking back on it, would you change your partner situation or anything else about the situation? Um, I think I, I think it was good like the part the partner that I had we worked well together and we were both able to bounce ideas off of each other and although we did have that little like bump in the road I think it's still like important um and it, I feel like it helped shape me as like a person because I was able to deal with this difficult situation and I know like in general talking to people even when you have like differences in opinion is important and being able to communicate in a way that where like both parties end up coming to a decision is important and being able to like have that experience I feel like would help me with any encounter I have in the future. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Courtney, what did you think about that? Um, I thought it was good on coming up with the situation <clears throat> on the spot. It maybe wasn't, you know, I guess the most powerful as it could be, but you know, not everybody is going to have kind of that standout situation that they can identify. And so she didn't fight the prompt. She answered that it was applicable. She said like a lot. And so that's one thing that um, Michelle, you'll, you, mock interviews will help on because filler words, or if you're kind of nervous and, and moving through it, it's it was enough to be noticeable, I would say, or notable. Yeah, I, I want to know what John is saying here. I hate, quote, rehearsed questions like these. It's a shame there's a double standard regarding rehearsal. I'm not sure what you mean, so, John. Rachel, you're muted. There's some real negativity happening in the chat right now. Yeah. Oh, um, so I don't think that you guys maybe know you're coming across so negative. So it gets back to mistakes to avoid. Um, yeah. I understand that TY felt a little bit put on the Scott, spot by Scott, um, and that, that was a tough first question. Also, you're going to get tough questions, and we'd rather you have hard experiences here where it's safe than in the real thing. And what I would offer to you for anyone who feels like, one, I don't know what you mean by rehearse, like we're all coming up with these off the top of our head, but yes, most interviewers have been given a script. They've been told, ask these same eight questions to everybody. So they are going to be rehearsed. That's the way it works. But he could have said, she didn't answer the question I wanted her to. And now on my little rubric, I give her a zero and moved on. But he didn't. He said, I'm going to keep pushing politely and challenging her because I bet I can get to how she feels, mm -hmm. which is what I asked. So mm -hmm. he was doing her a favor. Yeah. Yeah. He was and giving her a chance to move through her nerves and feeling put on the spot and answering technically and going, but what do you feel? So when he said, hey, I asked you what you felt, that wasn't him being interviewer anymore. That was him being trainer. He was explaining why he did what he did. So yeah, the yeah. power dynamic in this stuff sucks because 
you are checking to see if you want to go to that med school. It is a two-way street. All interviews are, but they're in control. So, and, yeah. and I can tell you that the way he delivered it and kind of drilled down on it is not uncommon. It doesn't happen all the time or with every question, but there is a component to putting somebody on the spot, seeing their critical thinking in you know, a stressful environment and pushing, pushing, pushing um, to see you know, kind of your, your thought progression. So this yeah. is, yeah, I was on point. And I, I wanna challenge that, that the complaint wasn't that TY wasn't rehearsed. The complaint was, or the criticism was that she didn't answer the question appropriately. And so that is just going back to questions one, two, and or, or uh, mistakes one, two, and three goes back to just communication, right? This is, this is a game of communication, the interview process. How well can you communicate? I obviously have seen your application that I'm assuming you took months to perfect. And now I want to talk to you one-on-one -on -one in the heat of the moment. How are you going to be able to communicate with me? Because... I, as the interviewer, am going to picture you in a hospital setting, in a clinical setting, taking care of a loved one. And can I picture you taking care of a loved one with your communication style, with how you build up rapport and trust between the two of us in, in that moment? So, um, yeah, it, it uh, I, I don't know. The, the, I, I might sound a little boomerish here, but it's like, Everyone does not get a trophy, right? <laughs> Everyone is not going to be treated uh, with with white gloves, right? This is you have to be ready to be challenged, and it's okay. That's where growth happens. So don't be afraid of of uh, being challenged here, making mistakes here. Uh, I, as Rachel said, right, it, the whole point of this process is for you to make make mistakes here, so that when it comes to your interview. You're ready for anything. So um, back to TY's question, or actually Mohammed's question. She's she's just bringing it back up. Is it okay to discuss your support for, I'm assuming, universal health care? Going back to the very beginning, what I said, mistake number six, not being authentic, right? If you authentically believe that that universal health care should be a thing, if it if it answers the question, go for it. Yep. Go for it. <clears throat> yep. All another, right. part, another part of this practice, though, is, you know, because they're going to want they're going to be nervous. So they're going to be constantly temperature checking or trying to temperature check with their interviewer. And that's not necessarily the best way to know how something is going. And if you're that off put by somebody's engagement with you or, you know, they're, they seem distracted or they weren't very warm maybe that was purposeful and the interview is yeah. actually going really well, but it's really going to throw you off if you're that affected. Yeah. So. I, really I've they, heard they can from, yeah, I, I've heard from, from several directors of admissions, that exact thing where they will get complaints like we're getting kind of complaints from students going that interview day was not fair and they treated me poorly and blah, blah, blah. And the, the director of admissions looks up the notes and it's like the interviewer loved that student. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like what? Mm -hmm. You're, you're reading Did well under pressure. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> happens all the time. Right? Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And it you actually happens know. the other way too. Like I tend to be a very mm -hmm. smiley, sweet interviewer because I find I get more out of people that way. And that does not mean that I like you. It just means that I'm from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's bring on Mohammed. Hello there, friend. Hello, Dr. Gray, how are you? Wonderful, say hello to everyone else too. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, how are you? <laughs> hello, Mohammed. Uh, Rachel, how about it? Mohammed, why do you want to be a physician? Um, so I want to be a physician because um, from my own personal experiences, um, you know, related to medicine, uh, I hope to bring the quality of life and to make uh, the leading clinical decisions that are necessary to help patients, um, you know, live their life to the fullest. Um, so I've had many experiences um, in a clinical setting and then in my own personal life, you know, with my own father's illnesses, which, um, you know, I've seen firsthand how it's like, 
uh, basically to suffer from an illness, whether it be arthritis or a stroke. And I'm, I could see how debilitating it is. And, um, you know, as a doctor, I want to have that control where I can um, basically have that, uh, you know, basically make those leading clinical decisions to help them, uh, you know, regain their health and to hopefully help them uh, enjoy their lives to the fullest. Okay. Uh, so why not nursing? Um, so I think that kind of goes back to um, basically making the lead clinical decisions. So um, I think with nursing, the thing is, is that um, you're basically kind of just, you know, on the sidelines. And of course, you do have a major, uh, you know, you know, you part in the process of healthcare. Uh, but I think as a physician, you're basically, uh, you know, making those lead clinic, uh, leading clinical decisions. Uh, decisions where you're basically, you know, diagnosing the patient, uh, coming up with treatment options and stuff like that. And uh, basically, I want to be in that front lines to basically uh, make those decisions um, and to kind of lead a team to help them. And that's kind of what inspires me to become a physician. Okay, so we'll stop there. How do you think you did? Um, I, I stuttered a bit too much. And I don't know if my answer is very satisfactory. So I don't know. Um, I thought you started strongly. Some of the folks in the chat are commenting about how your voice is just really soothing. And it's true. Like, I don't know if you're calm or not, but you're given calm voice. So that's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you said personal experiences, I was like, good. And then you didn't really give me any. Right. <laughs> to generalities. You briefly mentioned your father and arthritis, but you know, and again, it didn't have to be a 15 minute answer, but you opened with personal and then almost immediately switched to generalities. And the problem, it wasn't a bad answer. The problem is I'm gonna do 10 more interviews today and I'm not gonna remember your answer. It's not gonna resonate because it was just, I know you've got more in you, right? I don't know you, but I know you have more because you wouldn't have been working all this hard for this time if there wasn't a better reason. So I want you to dig deep and keep thinking about what your why is, because I, I know there are richer answers back there. Absolutely, thank you so much. Good job, Muhammad. Yeah, good job. All right, we're having some fun tonight. Uh, let's bring on Hadley. Hadley, hello. Hadley, our young friend. Yes. Oh. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll take a turn, uh, with my favorite okay. starter, Hadley, tell me about yourself. Well, uh, have you got all day? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I come from a military family of 12 and I was actually adopted out of foster care when I was really young and we were also homeschooled, which is one of the ways that kind of allowed me to venture out and kind of learn what I really wanted to do, which was, is being a doctor. Uh, when I was a lot younger, I used to spend a lot of time with my grandma in the hospital. She was a nurse for, for over 40 years, and she taught me a lot about the healthcare field and I am straying off the question. <laughs> Glad you caught that. Keep going. Jump back in. Um so I graduated from high school when I was 15 years old and started my bachelor's degree uh right after. Um I was able to complete that in two years because I did some dual credit during high school. And some things that I enjoy doing include sewing um, and cross-stitching. I don't know if you know what that is, but currently I'm working on a portrait of my family. So it's, it's a big project. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Um, what, what's the favorite thing? What's your your favorite thing to sew? Or what what are you uh, most proud of to date? Probably a purse that I made for my mom. It was uh, all made out of jean fabric. Like I said, I come from a family of 12 and we have a lot of old jeans and we can't really donate them because we like donating stuff newer. So I kind of cut them into pieces that I could use and designed the outside of the bag and created a purse. Yeah. I think today that's probably the best because of the detail and the stitches that I was able to get. They were all even this time. So <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. How do you think you did Hadley? Uh, not the best. Cause like I said, I was straying off the question. But I think once I kind of got warmed up, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I did. I do have a problem with saying, uh, so I, I'm trying to get that fixed. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you, you jumped in and you started to go down the path of, of why medicine and where did this interest in medicine comes from? And that's not a question at hand here, at least not the way that yeah. uh, we recommend answering it. Um, now, um, the question is really, I want to get to know you. I want to understand who you are, where, where you come from and, uh, the things that make you tick, the things that you enjoy doing. And so I think I'm going to remember you as the Jean purse lady, right? You, you are the one <laughs> when I'm sitting in the admissions committee going, oh, I, I remember her and I'm picturing this bag. And I, I want to know, like, is it a really big toad? Is it a small little clutch? Like what, what kind of bag? Oh. And, and why do I know bag names like that? I don't know. I just do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so that kind of fun stuff that comes out um, about who you are and what your interests are, uh, is fantastic. So good okay. good job allowing that stuff to come out. So more personalized. Yeah. You got it. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the the things about foster care, being adopted, 12 kids, uh, Jean Purse, right? Where, where are you from? Who's your family? What do you do for fun? Those are kind of the big bullet point ideas potentially to, to lean into. Mm -hmm. Good job, Hadley. Yeah, I definitely love that you caught yourself and redirected because yeah. sometimes when people go off track, they cannot get back. Yeah. So good recovery. Yeah. And it's okay to like in the middle of the question go, uh, I think I, I think I strained a little too far. Let me regather and, yeah. and just keep going. Right. This again is normal human conversation. You, you'll you'll notice earlier uh in this session. I was like, what do these top three have in common? And then I got around to me saying what it was. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, it's just normal, right? This is normal human conversation going on here. Um, I was going to make one other point. I forgot it again. So we'll just uh, we'll keep rocking. Oh, I remember now. Uh, beware of humor. Um, so Hadley started that with, do you got all day? Um, it was cute. Humor. Not everyone has the same kind of um, humor genes. So be very, very, very careful with humor. It's my recommendation. All right, John Doe. John the Anonymous. Sure. Yep. <laughs> can you guys hear me? We can. Yep. Already. Dr. Scott Wright. Lay Hi, John. In, lay Hi, John. into John here. Hey. Hi, John. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. How are y'all today? Yeah, doing really well. I have a question for you, John. Okay. If uh, John, if you were in a grocery store and you saw somebody stealing groceries, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, um, this would be a tricky situation because if I see someone stealing groceries, I don't know what's going on with their life. Why are they doing that? So personally, I wouldn't want to make a big deal about it maybe I would probably go and approach them uh, privately, just uh, say like, hey, uh, I saw you taking uh, groceries from this. Um, do, do you perhaps are you need of any financial help? Maybe I can get you some resources or anything like that. 
um, I wouldn't, you know, immediately just drag them out to the authorities. Um, but then if they said that um, they probably just stealing it just because maybe they, they didn't really have a valid reason, maybe then in that case, I would um, try and report them to the store manager. But first of all, like I said, I would want to make sure that I know the situation, why they are trying to steal the groceries and how I can help them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what if they basically said, mind your own business? Um, yeah, I mean, in that case, if they aren't comfortable with me talking, then I know that I'm not the best person to handle that situation. So I would then in that case, uh, report them to the manager or whatever authorities are present at that time, because they might be in a much better situation to handle that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. That's good, good, good answer, John. Okay. And I Jeff suspect, John. is John really your name? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I just didn't want to let out. That's all right. <laughs> no, I'm just joking with you. How do you think no. you did, John? I um, think I did okay, but um, I think uh, sometimes I repeated the word maybe a lot of times, uh, but otherwise I, I think it was okay. Huh? Yeah, I thought you did great um, yeah, so Scott says you did great. Is is it bad that the the environment that we live in? The first thing I thought of was like, depends on the state I'm in. If it's like gun wheeled in Texas, I'm gonna stay far away. None of my business. I didn't see anything. That's yeah. funny. My first thought was, unless it's like purely only junk food and beer, I didn't see a damn thing. You know, like you know, if, if I thought it was someone who was stealing food to party, I might mind. But if it's anything <laughs> even remotely close to wholesome, I would just be like, nope. But that yeah. doesn't mean I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I would go up like, to them with a, do you want to buy a mystery box for a dollar? And there's $500. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jimmy Darts. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I love TikTok. Um, okay. <laughs> That's hard. Um, good stuff. All right, Christian, let me uh, lower. Oh, uh, Christian. As soon as you said my name, I said, oh, great. Oh, great. Here <laughs> we go. Courtney, Christian says he's ready. Let's go, oh. Christian. Okay. Uh. So you're probably very aware that there have been a number of hot topics on healthcare widely publicized in the news, one of which has been really polarizing the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So can you tell me as somebody who's an aspiring physician, how you feel like this impacts healthcare? So as an aspiring physician, I think that Roe v. Wade um, has a significant impact on healthcare, mostly because um, in the essence, Roe v. Wade being rescinded ends up being that um, reproductive rights are no longer in the choice of women. Um, and that can be very detrimental to women who have um, health care issues that are attached to their reproductive rights. And this, in turn, I think causes an issue because for say, if a woman wants to get an abortion and due to, um, let's say, an uh, impacted, um, like one of the, uh, the, let's say like the baby is kind of growing on the ovaries, I forgot the exact term for that, um, and it's detrimental to their health, uh, a physician may or may not be inclined to, depending on what state they are in, um, to give that woman an abortion. Um, and I think that um, is very significant in itself. Um, so yes. Okay. So uh, this isn't specifically necessarily related to Roe versus Wade, but it's along the same line. And I'd like to get your take on this since um, because of your first answer, do you feel like the biological father should have a say in whether or not a fetus is aborted? Um, that's a great question. I think that, do I think the biological father should have a say if the fetus gets aborted? I think that personally, yes. Um, and I only say this because it, 
it takes the father. And in that case, if it was conceived, you know, I would say through, you know, I would say intercourse or so, and not like uh, it was inconceived, like in vitrally or, or, or another type of way in, sen in a sense that uh, since it takes two to make a baby in this sense that the father should have a say on um, whether or not abortion should be carried out. Um, and I think that usually that isn't the case, at least to my knowledge. So yes, that's my answer. Okay. Thank you. How do you think you did? Um, I was a little nervous, stuttered a little bit, but I tried to be as concise as possible and not drag it on. Um, I also tried to answer the question. So on a scale of one to 10, I say like 6.5, seven on a good day. All right. What do you think, Courtney? Um, I thought he did pretty well. It was, it was right in, I would say about that average range. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was asking what impact do you see this having on healthcare? Not necessarily what his opinions are or anything yeah. like that. I just wanted to know impact. So, you know, physician care, um, patient numbers, things like that. Um, and then knowing that he kind of steered towards some of those things, I wanted to pose a follow-up question just to kind of get that take on that. Um, you know, usually people are all about you know, they kind of take this question and go through women having rights um, to their bodies or, you know, yeah. um, to making this decision. So then that next one really kind of throws them off because it's, it's difficult to say, but I think overall, that can be a really difficult question. And he did pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, the, the a lot of the initial comments were like, Oh, the, right, right to the tough one. And Oh, like, that that's a, a hard hitting one up. set up. Yeah. The setup. And, and remember, right. It wasn't, what is your opinion on this? Right. Mm -hmm. It was, what is the impact of this? Mm -hmm. So whether you're pro-life or pro-choice uh, wasn't the question mm -hmm. and, and shouldn't be a part of the answer because the question is what's the impact on healthcare. So um, you as a critical thinker, you as a future physician, how do you potentially see the impact of this on your future patients? And that's the question. And anyone mm -hmm. should be able to, even if you don't fully understand. And here's a big point that we, uh, obviously, this is a very short session. Application Academy is a 52-week long program where we're, we're constantly interacting and talking about lots of things. Um, uh, in the interview prep module, you'll hear me talk about the fact that we're not expecting you to know things, right? You don't have to know the legalities of Roe v. Wade and and the individual states and how they're making decisions and everything else. This is all thought experiment stuff, is, is what can you potentially think about as consequences of what may happen? And you may be technically wrong, and, and as the only physician here on the panel, I may go, yeah, that's not really right, but I'm not expecting you to understand medicine or healthcare to the level that I know it, um, and that's okay. And if I was a lawyer, I wouldn't expect you to know the laws around the things that we're talking about. Again, it's just mm -hmm. a lot of thought experiment stuff, so don't be afraid yeah. to think and talk hypothetically of like, well, I'm not really sure what exactly I should do, but here's what I'm thinking about. Yep. I think that's such an important point and it kind of mm -hmm. gets at there, you know, with some questions and comments about like, am I allowed to use personal experiences? Am I going to get penalized for the wrong answer because it's, it's polarizing and I happen to disagree with my interviewer. The interviewer should be able to see beyond that. Um, but yeah, part of your job in this is to be able to answer a question in a way that's not deeply dogmatic, right? Think about the ramifications and sort of how your brain is processing the question, right? If you guys had good high school math teachers, then hopefully you were granted partial credit, right? So if you could solve the differential equation, um, but got two plus three equals six, you still got some credit, this sort of works like that. Um, so you don't, you don't need to think so much about, am I allowed to say y'all? Um, am I allowed to give my own personal experience? It, it's a conversation. Um, you know, you should keep it relatively professional, but at the level of like talking to a humanities professor, you know, um, so just try to remember that it's more about showing your work 
than yeah. getting the right answer. Yep. Show your work. Love it. Love it. All right. Good job, Christian. Jordan, come on down. You're the next contestant <laughs> on The Price is Right. I love that show. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. Can you guys Hello, hear Jordan. me? Yes. Is Hello. on the air? Uh, it is Drew. Drew hosts it. All right. Our Thank our you. lovely veteran Drew Carey. That's his name, right? Drew Carey. Yep. Um, yeah. Former Marine. Anyway, uh, there's, a, there's a whole documentary on it about a super fan that cataloged everything, all the prices and stuff, and he's been tracking it for years and years and years. I think it's oh, on really? Netflix. Yeah, I watched it because I'm that lame. <laughs> there is one. The whole documentary. Uh, all the, all that told me was you don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Marathoned it in one day. Leisure anyway. time different. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Uh, who's up? Um, me, Jordan. <laughs> no, I know, I know Jordan's up. Which, which Jordan, one of you like, gets to oh, harass? It's Rachel's, it's Rachel's turn. Think Rachel's think turn. All right, all right. Uh, Jordan, tell me about a time that you were in a leadership role and um, you were challenging to sort of get your vision across. How did you, how did you solve that problem? Yeah, um, so one of the times that I was in a leadership role was uh, during uh, the brink of COVID. I actually started to work in a research lab and really what the original position was that we were going to do COVID research, but it ended up being a position where we were just um, doing uh, PCRs. And uh, we basically had a lot of different people that would come in and uh, train and uh, learn how to do the PCR for saliva samples. And so my first couple of weeks, it was very difficult because I was trying to adjust to this new type of science that I wasn't really sure of how to do. And um, as I got better at the position, I started to learn more efficient ways to do um, different aspects of the procedure in order to get it done in, uh, in a quicker time, especially with the amount of tests that we would have in a shift. And um, certain other research assistants that I worked with, it just depends on how they did it. And it was all about like, what was the best way for them? And so we had to kind of work through what was the best way to do this. and. I was struggling at first with how can I get my point across and is this the best way to do it? Am I taking shortcuts? And so we actually, in the beginning of one of our shifts, I just decided, hey guys, like, can we just have a quick meeting and go through um, the procedure and see if this is the best way that we can do it in order to get through like these 800 tests by 12. And we sat, we had the meeting, we wrote down the notes, we looked through the protocol and once we completed it, we figured out that it was a combination of all of our ideas that was the best way to be most efficient. And when I went into it, I think that I was thinking mostly about my own, oh, this is my great idea. But as I met with the team, I realized that all of our ideas actually helped get us to where we finished at 11 o'clock instead of 12. And that's kind of just what helped me in terms of just leadership in general. I after that, we decided to have meetings pretty, um, we did it like every two or three weeks and we would just have meetings in the beginning of our shift to make sure that we were still doing it in the best way, in the most efficient way, but also making sure that the tests were getting accurate results. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, how do you think you did? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like I kind of talked for a little long. Maybe. Um, it did take me a little while to see the point you were making. Yeah. You, you had a lot of context. So I was for, for the first maybe minute, I thought this is a job, but I haven't yet seen the leadership. And then, yeah. you know, you, you got me there. Um, so, I, uh, I, you know, could it have been a little bit more efficient maybe, but you know, the, yeah. I did say, don't rehearse. You, you know, you gave me an off the cuff answer that answered the question. Um, okay. one thing, it's a small thing, but I want to point it out to you because it's a good learning for every single person. Hey, listening ears up. Yeah. So you said a job in a lab, and then you said PCR. Now you don't know me, but let's pretend I'm the admissions <laughs> committee member. Let's pretend I'm a um, person who's you know a dean or director of admissions. I may have an MD. I may have a PhD. That PhD might be in science, or it might be in counseling or okay. rhetoric. So yeah. do I know what a PCR is? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Like halfway through, I was like, oh, I'm getting it from context. It's fine. 
Um, yeah. But so, and it's not a big deal. It's such a common mistake. It's going to happen in your um, activities essays too. When you talk about research, you'll just okay. have to remember that the more clinical and scientific experience you get, the more you need to remember to change your language. And again, I used that example before of like, you're talking to a humanities professor, the people you're yeah. speaking to are well-educated, bright people. It's just that you have some niche knowledge they don't. So just avoid yeah. that kind of science shop talk. Okay. Yeah. I felt like I was talking too long and I was like, I probably should explain this, but I just don't, I feel like I've already talked too long. I don't know so. that I needed it. You had work you had to do. You guys figured it out as a team. Like I got the gist, um, Okay, but I didn't know what PCR was. So I was like, Hmm, I wonder if this is important. And then eventually <laughs> it's not. But so, okay. In essay that could throw me off. Right. And yeah. it's just, you don't want to distract from the quality of your answer with those kinds of things. Okay. So. Thank you so much. Good job. Mm -hmm. Good um, job. There are lots of great questions. I think maybe should we switch to just answering some questions to make sure people understand? Yeah. Um, or do we want to do one more? Well, you haven't done the yeah. second one. So yeah, you everybody one has one. to do two. You have to go twice. <laughs> well, everyone doesn't have to do two. Yeah, they uh, do. They're right, desperate. Right. Right. Look at them. They're baby. symmetry. <laughs> they want one more. <laughs> one more, one more, one more, one more. That's what they're saying. They love you, Dr. Gray. Uh, Luke, Luke McGuire. Are you Lizzie's brother? Uh, pretty close, I would say. <laughs> pretty close, good. Pretty close. Good. Um, Luke, are you applying to osteopathic schools? Um, I actually am. So okay, yeah. So okay. I mean, I'm I'm applying to maybe a couple. So okay. um, I'm so. I'm on that that range of, but yeah, Luke. Why are you interested in osteopathic medicine? So I'm an interested in osteopathic medicine because from a younger age, one of my, uh, my mom, so she's a nurse, one of the doctors that she had the greatest connection to with her patients was an osteopathic physician. She works at a, uh, like a, uh, rehabilitation facility. And from what I've seen firsthand with osteopathic medicine, um, it's really for me, uh, the connections that those physicians make, um, those stronger connection and the stronger bonds that I've seen. I also work at a ophthalmology um, office. So I'm a opth ophthalmic technician. And from what I see from the patients who are referred to us, a lot of the time their primary care providers are osteopathic physicians and kind of, talking about that with them as well, because I also like to get their insight. Um, I like to get their insight because as a person who's interested in both allopathic and osteopathic, I like to get their insight too. And I get, I like to hear what they're talking about. And a lot of the time they actually prefer osteopathic physicians as well. And that kind of goes to reinforce a lot of the experiences that I had, uh, when I was younger growing up, um, meeting the, the physicians who are from osteopathic and um, kind of being exposed to both um, from my, the clinical aspects of my healthcare of um, allopathic because all the physicians that I work with at ophthalmology clinic are um, allopathic and kind of the experiences that I had when I was younger, getting the best of both worlds. So those were some of the reasons why that I would want to pursue a degree in osteopathic medicine. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how do you think you did? Uh, I was kind of thrown off guard because I mean, I was, uh, I was kind of listening actually on the way to work, listening to one of your podcasts today about osteopathic <laughs> medicine and, uh, told, telling them not to, not to say, Oh, I like it because it's more of a holistic approach. And I kind of felt like I was going down that path of just talking about more compassionate. But then again, I kind of that's how I saw when I was growing up of osteopathic medicine. So okay. I, I kind of felt like um, I was going down that route a little bit, even though I just heard that this morning driving to work. So <laughs> Awesome. Fucking up won't help. <laughs> yeah, I know. Was, I know. It was really good. It was really Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, so Courtney, <clears throat> as, as the resident former director of admissions at an osteopathic medical school, what, what were your thoughts there? He didn't say, oh, holistic. Um, yeah, uh, he, did, he didn't use the cliches tool. Yeah. 
just another tool for my the tool tool toolbox. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think overall, um, my follow-up question immediately would have been because we have MDs on our faculty is, are you saying that MDs are not compassionate? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, uh, corner to, to kind of push yourself into if you're saying that the relationships the DOs have with their patients is better than the relationship that the MDs yeah. have. And it's it's a really hard question. Um, yeah. And it's hard because they're like so similar and basically the same. And I know I get flamed online from other uh, pre-med, uh, med school dropout content creators who <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one specific med school dropout content creator who's like, those people who say that MDs are the same as DOs, they don't know. I'm like, well, you dropped out of med school, so you don't know anything. Um, mm. So anyway, <laughs> no, Dr. Juval did not drop out of med school. He dropped out of uh, his residency. That's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I so would no, say, yeah, yeah, because people are saying, okay, well, how do you answer it? And I would say, um, you know, obviously you're interested in medicine in a multitude of pathways, but do you resonate with the tenets of osteopathic medicine? Do you know the tenets of osteopathic medicine and um, what's, what's the draw there? I know our med students would often say that it was really helpful to just have that 200 additional hours to learn anatomy better, just from palpating on different bodies and, yeah. and you know, physiology and things with the gross anatomy lab in tandem. So, I mean, there's things like that, that you can kind of focus on where it's not just because, you know, MDs only see their patients as a symptom or, you know, DOs are somehow nicer, you know? Yeah. So one of my <clears throat> students is in ophthalmology residency. Is he going to use OMM? Probably not. Um, <laughs> you want to palpate the eye? <laughs> yeah. You know, probably not. And, and there's plenty of DOs that, that don't ever use it, but <laughs> It's just a, just an additional part of training. Yep. And, and so you don't have to be DO versus MD. Yep. It's, it's pursuing medicine and knowing a little bit about the philosophy, I would say, and then keep it fairly Love it. focused. Love it. Yeah, I, I always make a joke about the, uh, the Osteopathic um, Pathologist Association. I'm like, I wonder how much they're using their OMM. Yeah. Probably yeah. not. And that's okay. Radiologist, yeah. like... Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. okay. Um, just see patients, yeah. let alone touch them. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, but jokes on everybody else. They're in Hawaii looking at their forty slides, oh, sure. and no, then they're, they're done. Not, that's a, <laughs> and yeah. we need them. We need all kinds we of do. Positions, including yeah. radiologists. Yeah. So, uh, yep. 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 Um, so Ty says, "Is it okay to say there's not that much difference?" So I'm applying to both. Again, it depends on the question, right? The very specific question. If they're saying, what's the difference between the two, then they're asking you to compare contrast. If they're saying, why DO, then the, you don't necessarily have to compare because it's hard to compare. Just talk about the pros that you, you see from the, the DO side. And I think um, Thon or Than said, what if you just didn't think about it? And I noticed, I think Thon, maybe it wasn't you, but someone had also said with the pro-choice, uh, pro-life question, right? The one that was about impact of healthcare, but many of you heard of give opinion. Yep. If you say I've never reflected on it, that does not reflect well on you. Yep. Yeah. You're, I mean, I, I know we have a few people here graduated from college when they were 17, but most of you are late <clears> teens, <throat> early twenties. Some of you in your thirties or forties, if you're considering your career in healthcare and you're not thinking about multiple healthcare avenues and about the most major issues impacting healthcare today, I mean, that's your choice, but that may not give you the impression that you thought seriously about your career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ton, yeah. I think it's Ton. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you for correction. Yeah. I knew a Ton Ton spelled the same way. Double, double name. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, all right. What other questions do we see? I don't know how you say it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it is a Ton Ton. All right uh cool cool <laughs> let's just double everything uh do you see any good questions rachel i'm scrolling through my list yeah, here for some that aren't just about the do question <laughs> albert says application academy is great i was in it last year and is it a huge support system going through the application thank you albert 
Um, Nisa Nish, Nishi asks, can we answer why not nursing or osteopathic with, I just, oh, that was the, the one you just answered. Yeah. Uh, I've never thought about it. Yeah. Oh, Susan asked a good one. Uh, asking about team or group activities that some schools use as a part of the interviews, ability to work as a team, listening skills, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, so, so a way that I typically simulate that in a, a mock interview scenario is I'll uh, ask a question and then I'll say student A answers it this way, student B answers it this way, you go third, go, give me your, give me your answer. And so the, the general um, idea is that you don't ignore what was said before, right? You're in a group setting. You can agree, disagree with who comes before respectfully. Um, uh, if it is a free free for all group setting where you're not kind of given an order, you don't want to be the alpha, you don't want to be the sheep is is my typical saying there where you don't want to overpower the conversation, uh, but you also don't want to hide in the corner. I was um, invited to, to speak at the University of Florida career counseling slash pre-med office uh, earlier this year for a, a mock interview event. And sat in on uh, group mock interviews. And it was very clear, like, who, uh, it, luckily, the students, nobody was the alpha, but you could clearly see who the sheeps were. Um, and and uh, not in the political sense that we use sheep now, but just shy the quiet people. ones, the shy <laughs> ones uh, that that didn't really want to say anything or too afraid to say anything. And that doesn't give the best confidence that you're going to be a good presence again in a, a group setting. When you're rounding with the team, you're doing these big group, um, multidisciplinary uh, healthcare teams taking care of patients. What else? Scott, Rachel, you see any questions or uh, yeah, Courtney, you see any questions coming ones through? That, like maybe we don't want to answer, but I want to like question the question, right? So one question here is, can I give a strong social opinion in an interview? Another one is, what should I say if the interviewer asks us if there's anything else you'd like us to know about you? With respect, I don't know what you want them to know about you. How can I tell <laughs> you the answer to that question? Yep. Now, I get where you're coming from. Um, and I guess this is my theme tonight, tough love, right? <laughs> um, I want you guys to step out of what am I supposed to say and go back to that feedback that Layla Amiri gave Dr. Gray, which is when she was the uh, dean or director of admissions, her interviewers would come to her and say, they wouldn't let me get to know them. So if you're spending a lot of time thinking about is y'all okay or not, or am I allowed to give this opinion, what's the correct response to this question, then you're probably not being your most authentic self. Um, so what would, what would you like them to know about you? You might have five or 10 things you're really proud of. Any one of them are good answers. It might depend on what the other questions were that day. You know, I, like that, that probably isn't even gonna be the same answer in every interview, because it's gonna depend on what 10 questions came before it. Be yep. in the moment. Um, I saw a good uh, question. Um, it was what, uh, Albert says, I, I, would, I like the question, what would you be able to bring to the class if selected? Mm -hmm. And this is an excellent question. This is the question that is, you know, why should we let you into our medical school or you know, what are you going to bring to the class? Uh, and, and I think you have to focus. I was doing a um, mock interview earlier today and the person talked all about the school and nothing about themselves. And I think this is very common. Uh, the reason I think I match well with this school is blah, blah, blah. Or I really like your curriculum and I really like this and I really like that. So therefore, I think this is a good fit for me with none of which answers the question of why should we let you into our medical school? Uh, you know, I'm asking, the question is, what do you think you're bringing to the table that makes it to where we should accept you as opposed to someone else? And I need for you to talk about you. What do you, what are you bringing to the table here? What, what are you gonna bring, uh, you know, good teamwork with your, with your uh, peers? Are you going to bring a sense of compassion uh, built off of 
your experiences in life, uh, or you know, what what are you bringing to the table here? that is going to uh, enrich our class? That's, that's an important question. I agree. And Hadley said, how do you do that without sounding full of yourself? And, and th this is a very good question, Hadley, uh, a very good point. And wh what I wanna say to that is, I have interviewed <clears throat> thousands of students over the years, and I could probably count on two hands the number of times that I think a student came across as arrogant or cocky or, I think it's not very typical. You guys worry about it a lot, and it is it just doesn't come across that way. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, on occasion it does, but it's very rare. And, and I think you don't need to worry about that. Just tell me what is in your heart in terms of what you think is, you know, beneficial uh, about you and what you're going to do for this class if we were to select you. Yeah. So Susan says, thank you, Dr. Gray. It sounds like a good way to practice in a mock interview setting, but I hope we don't want all, quote, alphas as physicians just saying. I said, don't be the alpha and also don't be the sheep, right? We, we don't want alphas either, um, right? We want a mix of everyone. Yeah. Um, Ton asks, would the interviewer and committee care about your statistics after you get an interview? I think it depends. Um, I've seen some committees only use interview feedback as the selection criteria post interview. So, so the committee basically says we have we have one group of people reviewing people for the interview, reviewing applicants for the interview. If you got the interview, everything else gets thrown out, and we only care about your interview performance and your interview reviews. Um, and then other committees will um, look at everything again they'll look at the interview they'll look at your stats again they'll look at look at all of it so it just depends on the school and the committee yep i like this one from g uh i invented the cure for aids uh for my research what have you done <laughs> what have this? you done <laughs> <laughs> i've rejected you from medical school <laughs> goodbye boom <laughs> <laughs> right. oh yeah. man why yeah, you chose so that, not to take uh, a gap year? I, I, somebody said, how do I answer uh, MD, not PA? Somebody's saying, how do I answer? Why did you not choose to take a gap year? Yeah, you tell the truth. Someone else, someone else explain it for me. We can't tell you what your answers yeah. are. You tell, it's, it's very simple. You tell the truth. When, when uh, I do application academy uh, and we're on, we're doing interviews, the students, I'll ask them, how do you think that went? They're like, I thought it was great. And I'm like, why? Because that was my truth. I'm like, yes, it was your truth. Everything gets so much easier when you just tell your tell truth. The truth. Yep. Instead of trying to angle an answer for how do they want it and what is the, and what, just, just tell your truth. Yep. That's and it. then, you know, mock can be just for, actually getting a chance to verbalize it instead of just having all of these things that, okay, I want to talk about this. And I know I'm going to talk about this. You just need to verbally say it, sometimes polish it up just a little bit or, you know, work on your filler words. Yeah. But, see, but yeah, John, content John, should already be there. John is negative Nancy in the group tonight. Yeah, um, I, I, I would love to see John, not for stealing from the store question, telling your truth wouldn't work. Says who? Yeah, you. Are you on admissions committees? Do you think that you know more than these two people who have admitted hundreds, thousands of people to med school? Like, why, why do you think it wouldn't work? Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I think, John, that the, the, the thing is that, um, you know, these are not black and white things here. The, the, right. the, this is not a binary that we're yeah. dealing with. Yeah. There are nuances to these questions and there are going to be nuances to your answers and I think you really have to uh, to understand that the truth your truth is uh, is is a mixture of, of, a, of a lot of gray stuff that uh, that you can talk about and that you can examine with the interviewers and, and let that be that conversation that goes on and uh, uh, it's not going to be just uh, you know either this or that yeah yeah. So John, I, I want you to soften your heart a little bit 
and realize that this process probably isn't uh, as 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 tough as you think it is and and as demanding as you think it is or as perfection. maniacal. Yeah, the, all the those bad like that that's the kind of stuff I see on Student Doctor Network and Reddit. And and John, I don't know if you're one of those frequenters of like oh like it's just it's just not true. Like we we want to see human beings here. And yes, a, a student who answers if I was at the store and I saw someone stealing food as as the student answered tonight like a lot depends on the context, right? Yep. There are lots of people who go hungry every every night, every day in the most abundant country, <laughs> one of the most in, in this world. And they're stealing food. I would probably look the other way, like have at it. Oh, well, like, and and as an interviewer, I may not like that answer, but I may understand the the backstory and the context and the reasons why they're saying what they're saying, right? As, as Rachel said earlier, right? Show your work. It's a big part of this process is helping the interviewer understand the thought process behind how you got to that answer, right? If, if someone answered the question, oh, I would let them steal the, the corporations and capitalists are crazy and they charge X number of dollars and blah, blah, blah. Like that's a very different answer than food insecurity is a huge issue. And inflation is a huge issue these days. And there are people, unfortunately, that are living paycheck to paycheck who can't afford food. And and I don't know what the context is behind what they're doing. Stores have security policies and, and they'll figure it out and, and I'll just move on, right? Well, Very different okay. answers. And I mean, if you think about it, we want physicians that are human, right? I mean, we want them to be compassionate and empathetic. And a lot of the times that takes going through learning experiences like that and and not coming out as bitter or biased or judgmental or um you know all of those things that sometimes situations do make people so yep. you don't have to go in there and be perfect or perfect it's yep. we can teach you everything about medicine but you have to have at least you know an average or above level of social understanding and maturity to be able to handle that when we stick you in clinics and hospitals and actual practice locations your third and fourth year we just don't have the time to devote that much to social awareness and it's very base form like yeah. you can practice so the critical thinking like if you think about patient encounters that you guys have had or shadowing or scribing or things like that sometimes they're uncomfortable and sometimes things get brought up and you have to learn how to navigate these very complex situations, conversations, things coming in from left field, whether good or bad, for somebody else who's maybe a different background, different age, you know, different education level, things like that. So that's why we ask you questions to probe for those types of qualities or evidence for those qualities, because we need to see that you can critically think that you can navigate and that you're socially aware enough, at least at this level, so that, you know, when we do the standardized patients and when you do your rotations and things, you know, we're not putting you at such a disadvantage where we're like, oh, this is a professionalism issue because it, because you need certain skills to be, you know, an empathetic, good bedside manner physician that just, you know, yep. so that's why we ask the type of questions that we do. We're looking yeah. for those types of things. And that's how we glean it in a very short amount of time. So there is purpose behind it. And that's why we want you to be honest and just work us through the problem and, you know, don't, don't be put off, just come in, engage, draw them in, answer ways that you can authentically, use professional language, and you're good to go. Like that's, You've done everything to prepare. Obviously, they liked your academic profile. We have a very few number of interview slots that we can ever give out in a cycle for the 6,000, 10,000 applications that we receive. So if you've made it to this part, let them see you beyond the numbers that you have submitted. That is the best way to do it. So, you know, 
it, we're not going to interview somebody just to bring them in and say, you know what, Ugh. you know, like we just wanted to bring you in and tell you that your academic, <laughs> your MCAT, your MCAT sucks. <laughs> like we're not, we're not doing that. So, yep. you know, we just need to know soft skills, behavioral skills. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, off, I just, I'm off my soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> they I loved love it. it. You got all these hearts. I love it. Go, Courtney, go. They're cheering you on. Um, applicationacademy.com. If you enjoyed the session tonight, this is basically what Application Academy is. Uh, obviously, the interview mod uh, office hour settings will be similar to our sessions tonight. Um, use the, the promo code jumpstart or jumpstart installment if you want to do four payments instead of uh, just one payment for Application Academy. We are starting our live classes January 9th. Um, so so go check it out, applicationacademy.com. And, and as Albert said, it was fantastic. Um, unfortunately, I'm assuming Albert didn't get in or still waiting to hear back. Uh, so he's he's still hanging out with us. So um, yeah, let's uh we have one more session of jumpstart, not next Thursday, but the following Thursday, January 5th, where it'll be a lot of open uh QA. Zoom user asks any waivers. So we we will have a uh, scholarship opportunity. We have um, a student that we worked with, who we worked with uh, this past year, who is starting a little bit of a, a scholarship for uh, for students for Application Academy. So stay tuned uh, for that. All right. Oh, Alex, Anything else? You decided to wait. Okay. Cool. Okay. We'll awesome. See you again. Awesome, awesome. awesome. Final words of wisdom, Scott, Courtney, Rachel. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, uh, Festivus Feliz. is tomorrow. Feliz Navidad. The airing yes. of grievances. <laughs> Solstice was today. Um, thank you, negative 15 degree weather. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Everyone, have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next year. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.